Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Money Girl. I'm Laura Adams. If you're new to the show, I want to welcome you for tuning in. I've been hosting this podcast since 2008, and I'm the author of several books, including my Amazon number one new release, Debt-Free Blueprint, How to Get Out of Debt and Build a Financial Life You Love. You can find it wherever books are sold. And if you've gotten used to hearing my voice, if you're a longtime listener, you might be interested in the audiobook version. You can get that on Amazon or audible.com. Today's show is about one of the most confusing aspects of personal finances, at least in my opinion, and that's taxes. The IRS regulations are very, very complicated, and many of the tax rules change from year to year. So simply staying on top of them is a challenge in itself, even for people who do taxes for a living, whether you're a tax accountant or a tax attorney. And I'd say even if you have a relatively simple financial situation or you use a good tax software program, Taxes can still trip you up. In a lot of cases, if you don't know all the rules, you're probably not getting all of the tax credits and deductions that you could, and that's costing you money. So in today's show, I'm going to cover the answers to seven common and maybe not so common questions about income tax. These answers should help you comply with the law, minimize what you owe, and understand deductions and credits a little bit better. And we're also going to cover how to pay household workers or nannies. If you have any of these types of folks who are helping you with your day-to-day life, or maybe you will have some of them in the future, it's really important to understand how they should be paid. This is a topic that came up recently in my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. So if you're in the group and you brought this up, thanks so much. And if you're interested in joining the group, it's a really great group of people, a really good group of smart people who are helping each other and bringing some really important topics to light. So you can search for Dominate Your Dollars within Facebook, or you can send me a text message. Just text the word dollars, D-O-L-L-A-R-S, to the number 33444, and I will see about getting you in the group quickly. Usually it takes me maybe a week or so to approve. Be patient and I'll get you in there. And lastly, today's show is going to help you avoid trouble if you cannot pay your taxes on time. We'll talk about some ways to deal with Uncle Sam when you get overwhelmed with your tax bill. This is episode number 580 called Seven Answers to Frequently Asked Income Tax Questions. All right, if you're ready to dive in, let's get going with the answers to some common and not so common income tax conundrums. And just a reminder that if you want to review this information or any of the podcasts in written form, the notes for every show can be found in the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. All right, our first question is, who must pay income tax? I mean, it's a, a very basic question, but one that you you know may not have found the answer to. This comes from Michelle from Florida. She says, hi, Laura. I'm a longtime podcast listener and have purchased your books on Audible. I've got a burning question and think you're the perfect person to trust to answer it correctly. Is it true that filing an income tax return is optional or not required if you don't have any taxable income? Michelle, thank you so much for your kind words and your question. It is true that not everyone must file an income tax return. The requirements depend on how much you earn, your filing status, and your age. So let's talk about the rules for 2018. Let's say for last year, you were a single taxpayer. The rules say that you've got to pay taxes if your gross income exceeds the standard deduction, which is now $12,000. And if you're married filing jointly, the limit is double or $24,000. Now, if you're over age 65, these income thresholds go up just a little bit. They go up slightly. But that's the point at which which you've got to pay tax on your income. And when we talk about gross income, it's all the income that you receive that is not exempt from tax. And it typically includes your wages, your salary, retirement benefits, and your investments. It includes all sources of income, including any earnings that you might have from outside of the United States. And by the way, these income limits apply 
when you are not a dependent. If no one else can claim you as a dependent, these are the income limits. But if you are claimed as a dependent on someone else's tax return, you may be required to file taxes even if you earn less than the thresholds that I just mentioned. And if you're the parent or the guardian of a dependent who is required to file taxes, but that person can't do so on their own, maybe because they're a child and they're just you know not old enough to do it on their own, as their parent or guardian you must file an income tax on his or her behalf. The IRS specifies a lot more situations when you must file taxes, and these include having net self-employment income of at least $400 and receiving distributions from a tax-favored account like an IRA or an HSA, which is a health savings account. Now, even in years when you are not required to file a tax return. So let's say you're single, you earn less than $12,000, you don't have any self-employment income, you don't have any type of uh, distributions from an HSA. Even in those years when you're not required to file a tax return, you're probably going to want to do so anyway. Why? Well, that's because filing could allow you to qualify for refundable tax credits or to receive a refund for any federal taxes that were withheld from your paycheck during the year. So even if you don't owe tax, filing a return is the only way to get money back from the government that it owes you. They're not going to just send you a letter saying, hey, you get some money back because you overpaid your taxes last year. You've actually got to file a return in order to get that money back. So, you know, there's really not a downside to filing a return. And if you're not sure if you must file a return, I would encourage you to ask a professional tax preparer or an accountant. And there's also a really great tool at the IRS. Go to irs.gov. It's called the Do I Need to File a Tax Return Calculator. And I'll put a link to that in the notes for the show. It's, again, in the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. All right, the second income tax question that has come up is, when should you itemize income tax deductions? This one came from Megan S. She wants to know if she should itemize deductions and how to make it easier. Megan, thank you for sending in your questions. Deductions are super important because they act to reduce your taxable income. And when you reduce your taxable income, you reduce the amount of tax that you owe. So why would you pass that opportunity up? Every year, you're allowed to choose between claiming a standard deduction or itemizing deductions. And I previously mentioned that for 2018, the standard deduction is $12,000 for singles and $24,000 for joint filers. So when your total itemized deductions exceed the standard limits for your tax filing status, you're going to want to itemize because you're going to come out ahead. You're going to save more money by itemizing. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of people who should be itemizing are not because there is a little bit of record keeping involved. It is a little bit of a hassle. The trick is to understand which expenses are deductible and then to keep track of them very carefully throughout the year. Only then can you do the comparison to say, okay, here are the actual value of my deductions, and then here's the standard deduction, compare the two, and choose the method that cuts your taxes the most. So, um, you know, I'm going to tell you it's worth it if you would just, you know, track your deductions starting this year, maybe if you've never done it before. There aren't that many deductions anymore. I'll talk more about that. Um, But it really is worth the time and the effort to track your deductions. So reform under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 significantly increased the standard deduction. So it went up a lot from 2017 to 2018. And it also changed or eliminated some popular deductions. So if you itemized in the past, it may be that claiming the standard deduction will actually save you more money now, but you're not going to know unless you keep track of those deductions and do that comparison. 
Here are some of the most common and valuable deductions that you should be tracking. One is state and local taxes, and these also include real estate taxes if you own a home, and all of these get lumped into one deduction, and you can cap it out only uh, up to $10,000. So it used to be unlimited. Now tax reform has put a limit on it, only up to $10,000 home mortgage interest, and the points that you pay on up to $750,000 of debt. And using that debt to buy a home, build a home, or even improve a primary or a secondary residence with remodeling projects, any of those qualify for deductible debt. So what you get is a deduction on the interest and the points that you pay on getting those types of of loans for your home. Um, So that's definitely a very valuable deduction. It has been reduced down from a million dollars on newer loans. So if you've got an older loan, you're typically going to be able to claim interest on up to a million dollars of debt. But if you got a loan recently, like within the last year, that limit has come down to $750,000 worth of debt. And again, you're just claiming the interest portion. Another key deduction that you should be keeping track of is your medical and dental expenses. If they exceed 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, and by the way, this is going up in later years to 10%, so you need to be tracking this. It's going to get a little less valuable down the road. So if you've got a lot of medical and dental expenses, be sure that you're tracking them. They could help you reduce the amount of income tax that you owe. And another great deduction is for charitable donations. You get to deduct an amount that you donate that's up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. So if you're giving a lot to qualified charities, be sure that you're including that as a deduction. Now, what if you don't have enough deductions to make itemizing pay off? Well, there are some deductions that you can take even if you claim the standard deduction. For 2018, these include educator expenses. So if you're a teacher, you can deduct up to $250 of your expenses. Maybe you're buying supplies for a classroom. Those sorts of things can be deductible up to $250. Another opportunity for savings are contributions to a health savings account, or HSA. If you guys listen to the show, you know that I love HSAs. With these, these, even if you don't itemize your deductions, you still get to deduct up to $6,900 per year that you put into an HSA. Now, you do have to have a high deductible health plan to qualify for one, and that $6,900 limit is when you have a family plan. Another great deduction is for self-employment expenses. So this could be one half the self-employment tax. It could be contributions you make to a SEP IRA, a simple IRA, or any qualified retirement plan. And it also can be your health insurance payments. So remember that as a self-employed person, many of your expenses are going to help you cut your taxes. Alimony that you paid is also deductible, even if you don't itemize traditional IRA contributions, and those have gone up to a maximum of $6,000 or $7,000 if you're age 50 or older. So remember, those always help you save money no matter if you itemize or not. And lastly, student loan interest. If you've got student loans up to $2,500 per year on the interest that you pay on those loans is deductible if you meet certain income limits. If you're a high earner, you may earn too much to qualify for that deduction. And again, these are some nice ways to cut your taxes even if you don't itemize, even if you take the standard deduction. So Megan, I would recommend using a program such as Quicken or Mint to categorize these expenses throughout the year. And it will also flag you when it sees that a certain type of expense is tax-related. Then you can simply run a report at tax time. And for mortgage interest, your lender will send you Form 1098 for any year that your interest paid on a qualified mortgage exceeds $600. So, you know, you're going to automatically get that information directly from your lender. So, Megan, I hope that helps. And the again, the idea is just tracking it as carefully as you can so that you can make the determination each year about which method will save you more. All right, the third question we'll cover is, 
who can claim the home mortgage interest tax deduction? So speaking of the home mortgage deduction, that is a surprisingly complicated tax benefit. And yes, the rules for claiming it recently changed with tax reform, as I mentioned. Here's a voicemail that I received from an anonymous caller. Hi, Laura. I hope you're doing well. I have a tax question for you. My parents pay the mortgage and the property taxes on my home, but my name is on the title to the home and I pay rent to my parents in order to reimburse them for paying the mortgage. So can I claim the mortgage interest deduction on my taxes or is that only available to my parents since they're officially paying the mortgage? I appreciate your help. Thank you so much for your question. And by the way, if you want to leave a money question or comment for me, just call 302-364-0308. Again, 302-364-0308. And if you don't want your voice and your question played on the show, you can just say so in your message, and I will definitely honor that. So the interest that you pay on a mortgage, a home equity line of credit known as a HELOC, or a home equity loan for your primary residence or a second home can only be deducted from your income when there are two conditions that are met. The first is that you've got to file taxes on Form 1040 and itemize deductions on Schedule A. And you must have secured debt on a qualified home in which you have an ownership interest. So again, the mortgage interest deduction is one of those deductions that is only available to you if you itemize. And as I mentioned, the total amount of home debt that you can base this deduction on changed recently with tax reform. It went down from a million dollars to 750000 And this is going to apply for loans that you closed starting in 2018. So if you recently have a loan, it's going to be that $750,000 threshold. But if you have an older loan, you can still claim the deduction on up to a million dollars worth of debt debt. So again, if you've got an older loan, don't freak out. You can still deduct interest based on a million dollars worth of debt or half that amount, $500,000 if you're married and file taxes separately. But if you've got a newer loan, the limit is now $750,000 or half of that, $375,000 if you're married filing separately. I frequently get questions like the callers about who is entitled to claim the deduction. And the answer is that you can only claim the mortgage interest deduction for interest that you actually paid. Since the caller's parents are making the mortgage payments, they're the only ones allowed to claim the interest deduction in any year that they itemize. And guess what? If they don't itemize, no one gets to claim the deduction. Now, another question comes up when you co-own a property. So let's say you pay half of the mortgage and somebody else pays the other half. In that case, each person would be eligible to deduct 50% of the interest on his or her taxes. Even if your name is not listed on Form 1098, that's the form that the lender is going to send you showing the total amount of interest paid. Even if your name is not listed on that form, it's okay. If you've got an ownership interest in a primary or secondary residence and you paid mortgage interest, you can deduct that portion that you paid. If you're like the caller and you own a home, but you are not listed on the mortgage, one tip I have for you is to be the person to make the payments directly to the lender instead of paying, quote, rent. When you reimburse someone else's mortgage debt so they can make the loan payment, you can never claim the interest deduction. So if the caller's parents allowed her to pay the lender directly, she could claim the mortgage interest deduction. Another option would be for the caller and her parents to create a written contract that spells out her ownership interest. In that case, I would still recommend that she make payments directly to the lender, 
so that there's a clear paper trail. So what the caller described is kind of a common situation when maybe a young person doesn't have enough credit or a down payment to buy a home, but the parents want to set the child up in the home. And they may want to maintain that deduction because it is very valuable and there is a you know pretty high threshold in order to itemize. But if they don't need the deduction and if the child could benefit from getting that deduction, then I think making some other arrangements, whether it's just paying directly to the lender or setting up some kind of a contract, is going to benefit the younger person. Another situation is paying someone else's mortgage out of the goodness of your heart because either they're unemployed or maybe they're facing foreclosure. Again, if you don't have an ownership interest in the property, you're not entitled to claim the interest deduction. The bottom line is that you need some form of written proof stating your ownership and the amount of mortgage interest that you pay during the year in order to qualify for the deduction. If you have a more complicated situation than any that I've mentioned here, be sure to speak with an accountant or a legal professional who specializes in real estate. All right, moving on to the fourth question, which is, if my raise puts me in a higher tax bracket, will I get less pay? This is a question that I hear from time to time, and I will say when you make more money and you get bumped into a higher tax bracket, you want to pat yourself on the back. Don't worry about it. The U.S. tax system is progressive, and that means that not all your income is necessarily taxed at the same rate. So a tax bracket is a range of income that's taxed at a certain rate, and each tax bracket gets assigned a progressively higher rate, which means that only a portion of your income is taxed at the highest rate. Right now, there are seven tax brackets for 2018. They are 10%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 32%, 35%, 40%, 10%, 10%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 35%, and 37%. So let's say you're in the 24% tax bracket. Your entire income is not taxed at 24%. That's just the highest rate that's applied to your top range of income. Let's say you're a single taxpayer who made $80,000 last year. That amount of income would put you in the 22% tax bracket. But let's say at the end of the year, you got a raise. And so now you're going to make $83,000 instead of $80,000. But you realize that the cutoff between the 22% tax bracket and the next highest 24% tax bracket is $82,500. So should you worry about getting bumped from the 22% bracket into the 24% bracket? As I mentioned, absolutely not. You should be thrilled to get a raise because your income will not be taxed any differently except for the amount that falls within the top 24% tax bracket, which is $500. Again, $500 is the only amount that would be taxed at that slightly higher rate, the top rate for your bracket. So no matter your tax bracket, getting a raise always means that you take home more money. And I'll include a link to the IRS tax rates in the notes for the show so you can find out your bracket and calculate how much tax you may owe based on your income. Depending on where you live, you may also have to pay state income tax. Number five, which is, what's the difference between tax deductions and credits? Well, both tax deductions and credits are great because they reduce the amount of tax you must pay or they increase your tax refund. Deductions reduce the amount of income that you pay taxes on, which in turn reduces your tax. So a tax deduction is an amount that the IRS allows you to subtract from your taxable income. When you reduce your taxable income, you lower your tax liability. For example, if your taxable income is $40,000 and you're eligible to claim $10,000 in allowable tax deductions, then you only have to pay tax on $30,000 of income, not on $40,000. That makes a big difference. Tax credits are very different. These are a dollar-for-dollar reduction in the amount of tax you owe. That can be more valuable than a deduction. So if you're ever in a situation where you're trying to choose between a deduction and a credit, you'll want to look at that carefully. In a lot of cases, the credit may be more valuable for you. Here's an example. If you owe $1,000 in taxes 
if you have a $600 tax credit, that means that you would save that full amount and only owe $400. Question number six, do I have to pay taxes for a household worker or nanny? As I mentioned, several folks in my Dominate Your Dollars Facebook group brought up the topic of paying a nanny or other household worker correctly. This is an interesting question because many people don't realize that they are actually an employer and must provide a formal payroll with multiple taxes deducted and filed just like a business. Some of you guys may be old enough to remember nanny gate. That's a popular term for some problems that happened in the early 90s that caused two of President Bill Clinton's choices for attorney general to just go down the drain. It was discovered that both nominees had broken federal law by employing undocumented workers and failing to pay their taxes. So this is serious business. So what do the less rich and famous need to know about having a household worker or a nanny? Well, as I mentioned, it's critical to understand that if you hire workers to care for your children or to do housework, they are generally considered your employees. But some people will say, well, Laura, I already have a business. Can I just put that nanny or that person on my company's payroll? No, you have to pay him or her separately from your business. If they're not doing the work of your company, they cannot be considered a company employee. You have to consider them uh, an employee as a nanny or household worker exclusively. An employee is someone whose work you control. It doesn't matter if you control the work full-time or part-time. It doesn't matter if you found them through an agency or if you pay by the day, the hour, the job. It doesn't matter. As an employer, it's against the law to pay a nanny in cash and avoid paying taxes, even if your nanny prefers receiving cash and being, quote, off the books. The only household workers who are not your employees are those who control how they work or who are already self-employed. So for instance, I have a service that comes and cleans my apartment once a week. I do not control how they work. They come with their own supplies. They, you know, have their own agenda. They come at a time that we've agreed on, but it's not like I say, okay, you have to be here at a certain time or I'm not going to use your services. They control how they work. So they are not considered my employee. And likewise, if an agency provides a worker and that agency controls how a nanny does their work, the agency would be the employer, not you. So therefore, in the vast majority of cases, you can't consider a household worker just a contractor and issue a Form 1099. That's something that I think a lot of people think they can do. Well, I'll just give my nanny a 1099. If the nanny truly is under your control, they're not self-employed, they don't have other families that they work for, technically they are your employee. So if you employ a nanny, a babysitter, or any household worker and you pay him or her more than $1,000 per quarter or more than $2,100 a year, you are generally responsible for reporting their income on Form W-2. You've got to withhold income, Social Security, and Medicare taxes from their pay and also pay them overtime for hours worked over 40 per week. And depending on where you live, there may be additional benefits that you've got to legally provide as an employer, such as paid sick time and workers' compensation insurance. Not only is it illegal to skip paying tax for household workers, it's unfair to them. By not paying tax, you're costing him or her their future Social Security and Medicare benefits. Yes, paying a nanny properly by calculating and withholding taxes, issuing annual tax forms, maintaining the right records, and understanding employment law is confusing. It's time-consuming, and it's a major hassle, especially if you don't have experience running a business. So I'm going to recommend that you use a payroll service or even an accountant to handle these details for you. Check out services such as HomePay and Sure Payroll 
to take the stress out of being a household employer. The prices might range from about $40 up to $70 a month. In my opinion, it is well worth it. After all, the reason you hire household workers is to save time, not to spend hours each week processing paychecks and trying to stay compliant. And you can also check out IRS Publication 926 called Household Employers Tax Guide to learn more. And our final question, number seven, what if I can't afford to pay my taxes? This comes up from time to time around this time of year, especially if you're somebody that gets a surprise. Maybe you did not withhold enough taxes or maybe you're self-employed and you didn't pay quarterly taxes. If you cannot afford to pay Uncle Sam, you still have to file a return on time. So remember that. No matter if you can afford your tax bill or not, you still need to file a return on time. Failing to file on time results in late fees and penalties. So get that tax return done, then you can make arrangements to pay what you owe. But I will say, if you can't afford to pay something, even if it's less than the full amount owed, that will help minimize interest and fees. The IRS fortunately does offer a variety of payment options, including short-term and long-term payment plans. It depends on how much you owe. But remember, you're still going to owe interest and you're still probably going to have some penalties, even if you enter into a payment agreement, because ultimately you're paying late. And you might also qualify for what's known as an offer in compromise. This is a settlement to pay less than the full amount that you owe. So you want to check into that, especially if you do owe a large amount of money. The IRS may also agree to temporarily delay collection on your tax bill until your financial situation improves. So there are options, but you're going to need to check them out. I've included links in the show notes to where you can find out more about what the IRS has available for you. A big thanks to everyone who sent in a question that inspired this show. As I mentioned, you can send me your money questions by leaving a voice message at 302-364-0308, or you can send me an email through my contact page at lauradadams.com. And when you go to the podcast page at lauradadams.com, you will also find a link that's very handy. It will take you to the full archive of shows that go back to 2008. And if you'd like to get a weekly update from me, please visit lauradadams.com as well, or you can text me, text get updates, just one word, one phrase with no space, get updates to the number 33444. It's a short email filled with tips, tools, and resources that I think you might enjoy. And if you're not into email, another great way to stay in touch is to follow me on Instagram at Laura D. Adams, or as I mentioned, to join my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. Money Girl is produced by the audio wizard Steve Rickyberg with editorial support from the lovely Beata Santora. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please rate and review it on Apple podcasts. That's an easy, free way to give back, show your support, and help new listeners find us. You might also like the backlist episodes that I mentioned and show notes available at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. (laughs) 